All right, so section 29 is on optimization. So we're going to spend a couple days talking about optimization. This can be a particularly challenging topic for some people. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention in class and understanding what we're doing. But basically, optimization means you're finding the maximum or minimum of something. Um, so typical solutions would be find the route which minimizes the time it takes or the distance that it takes, right? Build a structure using the least amount of material. Build a structure costing the least amount of money. Build a yard enclosing the most amount of space. Find the least medication one should take, take to help a medical problem, and so on. Does that make sense? So you're trying to find maximums and minimums. Okay, so these are story problems, your phase. Um, so steps in solving optimization problems. You always want to think about what is the unknown? Like, what am I trying to solve for? What are the things that I was given? Um, you usually will have two equations in these. So one equation will allow you to solve for one of the variables, and then one equation is what you're trying to maximize or minimize. Draw a picture and use letters that make sense. So A for area, L for length, W for width, right? Um, decide when it's being maximized or minimized. That's what you're going to take the derivative of. So we're trying to find maximums of functions, minimums of functions. So we're taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero or undefined. Write an equation um, and then find the absolute max or min. So if it's a closed interval, make sure that you check the endpoints as well. All right, so on number one, it says you have 400 feet of fencing with which to enclose three rectangular spaces next to a barn wall, as shown. Okay, so we have the barn wall, so we don't need fencing along that side. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have x, and we're going to have x in these other locations as well. All right, those all have to be the same, otherwise it's not going to be a rectangle. All right, but we don't know what this distance is down here, so for now, I'm going to make it y. Okay, we have a total of 400 feet of fencing. So what I do is I say I have four pieces that are x in length plus y, and that gives me a total of 400 feet. This is not what I'm trying to maximize or minimize it, though. I was just given that information basically so I can solve for y. So I can say, oh, 400 minus 4x is equal to y. And some of you guys might have been able to do that without writing that equation. So it says find the largest area. Largest area is what you're trying to um, area is what you're trying to maximize, right? So we write the area equation. So the area of this rectangle is going to be length times width, right? X times y. So that's why we solve for y. We want it to be a equals and then everything with one variable. So we're going to have x times 400 minus 4x, which we can write as 400x minus 4x squared. OK, so now we're trying to maximize the area, right? find the largest area. So we do a prime. So I have 400 minus 8x. So the area is never, like the a prime is never um, undefined. So I just want to find when it's equal to zero. So when you do 400 divided by 8, you get 50. And then the question that we're asked to find is find the dimensions. So find the largest area that can be enclosed with as much fencing and find the dimensions. So I guess we should find the area first. So largest area. So we go back to our area equation. And we plug in. So we have 50 times 400 minus um, 4 times 50. So 200 times 50. <laughs> Andy, are you just solving everything over there? <laughs> I hear you saying all the numbers. So uh, 10,000 feet squared. All right, so that's the largest area, and then it also asks for the dimensions. So make sure you're answering all of the questions, because a lot of times there'll be like more than one thing for these. So dimensions. So we had 50, that's in feet. And then the other thing ended up being 200 feet, right? So we have 50, by 200, 50 feet by 200 feet. Oops. Okay, those are the dimensions. We're done. Okay, does that all make sense? All right, so that's basically how each of these is going to be set up. So we're going to have, usually have one equation to allow us to solve for a variable, another equation that we're maximizing or minimizing. Um, but what you should do, if you ever have one of these on the AP test, I'm kind of lazy about this. Um, I need to be better about it. Is you really should check um, to see that, that that 50, that was our critical value, right? You should check to see that it was going up and then down, right? So that way you have a maximum area. Does that make sense why you need to do that? But in this case, since you had something that was x squared, we know that the downward parabola. 
Now, someone in the last class realized, oh, wait, if I have a downwards parabola, can't I just use this equation that I learned in number two? Do you guys remember what it is to find the maximum of a parabola? Negative b over 2x. And I said, actually, you can. And the reason you can is because if you have a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c, and you take the derivative of it and set it equal to 0, subtract the b, and divide by 2a. Yeah, crazy. All the formulas you've learned before involve calculus, right? So that's why um, that equation works. So if you guys remember that, do it, because it's really just calculus anyway, right? All right, but only if it's a quadratic equation, only if it's a parabola. Um, you cannot do that if it's not a parabola. All right, you might remember these from pre-calc as well. In algebra 2, we did a little bit of this in algebra 2, but we always used our calculator to solve these before. OK, now we're going to use the calculus. So it says a square sheet of cardboard, 18 inches on a side. Okay. Uh, is made into an open box by cutting squares of equal size out of each corner. So remember, I, I did this in Algebra 2 for you guys here in my Algebra 2 class. I cut out the corners so you could see why they had to be squares in the first place and why it created an open box. So you can kind of, you know, cut out those corners. And when you fold up those flaps, this distance here is no longer 18 inches. Okay, you've cut out an x by x square from each side. So the x by x, x by x. So what do we write for that distance? Exactly, that's 18 minus 2x. And then the same thing right here, that is also 18 minus 2x, because we subtracted x from both sides. And when you fold it, you kind of get like a shallow box. That still has a square on the bottom, right? And these two distances are the same. And those are the 18 minus 2x's. But what's the height of the box? X. X, exactly. So usually when you're finding the volume of a box, you do length times width times height. And you do that in this case. It's just your length and the width are the same. So 18 minus 2x times 18 minus 2x. And then times x. So we're going to go ahead and multiply it out before we take the derivative. Because really, can you imagine like product rule with three different things? It would be really messy. Don't do that. So we're going to multiply it out. So I know one of you in this class at least knows 18 times 18. Good. Um, so we get 324 minus 36x minus another 36x, so minus 72x plus 4x squared. And then we're going to multiply that x in. So I'm going to write it as 4x cubed minus 72x squared plus 324x. Okay. So now we take the derivative. So when I take the derivative, I get 12x squared minus 144x plus 324. Okay. And 12 actually goes in all of those. You could do a quadratic formula, but in this case it does factor, so we'll factor. So I have 12 and then x squared minus 12x plus 27. So it factors into x minus 3 and x minus 9. So if I'm setting my derivative equal to 0, I get x equals 3 and x equals 9. So this is usually where you eliminate one of the possibilities. Okay, what one am I eliminating? 9, right, that's out. Can't be 9 because you can't cut 9 inches from both sides and have a volume left. It's like you would be uh, creating like an envelope, right? Does that make sense? Like there would be no like thickness to it. Um, you what? Uh, on the entire universe left. Yeah. There is no box. Volume. Yeah. The volume of everything else in the world. All right, so you still kind of need to do that check. And remember on the AP test, even if you do this number line, you still have to kind of write about it. What's the, uh, the volume? You can't have a zero. That's also a critical value because it's on a closed interval, basically. And then nine was the biggest that you could cut out there. So that's kind of like the end of the closed interval. So if you test on each side, you had an x cubed equation. And those were the two critical values, these two. So it ends up being up and then down, and then it would go back up if you have more up there. But really, we're just worried about the fact that it went up and then down. We want to know that that is the maximum volume. 
So you should always show that stuff. I know it's annoying. And that's why I was like, I get very lazy and I don't do it because I assume that it's going to be the answer. But sometimes it is the endpoint um, on the AP test. So you really should check. All right. So we're trying to find the dimensions of the box with the mo maximum volume, volume. So we know 3 is going to be the height. So it's going to be 3 inches there. And then when I plug in 3 for the other ones, 18 minus 6, I get 12. And so 12 here as well. So my dimensions are going to be 3 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. You don't have to write it in any particular order. All right, good. All right, still okay? You're not terrible. Hopefully you've been prepped enough and pre-calc enough for two. All right, number three. So it says find the point on the parabola y equals 9 minus x squared closest to the point 3, comma 9. These were always my least favorite because they're kind of the hardest ones to take the derivative of. Okay, so let's draw this parabola. So y equals 9 minus x squared. So we know it's a downwards parabola. Its y-intercept is 9. What are its x-intercepts? Yeah, 3 and negative 3, right? If you set it equal to 0. Factors in a 3 minus x and 3 plus x. Let's that. All right, and we want to find the point that is closest to 3, 9. So I don't know why, but everybody, whenever I get this problem at first, what they always say is this point right here. They're like, oh, that's the shortest distance, just going straight to that vertex. No, it has nothing to do with the vertex. It's not the vertex. Okay. Whenever you're doing the shortest distance, uh, if you ever did this in geometry, uh, it works out to be the, um, the line that is perpendicular to that tangent line. So if you drew in a tangent line to the curve, it's so basically the normal line, right? We talked about normal lines before. Uh, and that may not make sense, but if you think about connecting to any other point, do you see how that makes like a right triangle? The hypotenuse is clearly like longer than the, the shortest leg, the um, one with the 90 degrees. So no matter where you're drawing it, it's longer. The hypotenuse has to be longer. Does that make sense? So do you see why it has to be like straight there? It's kind of weird. All right, so we get that. Okay, so we don't know how, what this point is. We can kind of guess. It looks like around 1 somewhere, right? But we're not sure. So what we do is we write it as a point. We write x, comma, and if we plug in x into our function, right, our y value is 9 minus x squared. So 9 minus x squared. And this other point was the 3, comma, 9. So if I'm find a, trying to find the point that is closest, what am I minimizing? Distance. So we need the distance formula. So hopefully you guys all remember the distance formula. <laughs> so your distance formula is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Scott, yep. Can't you find the normal line? Find where it intersects with? Uh, you could try to find the normal line, but how would you do that? You'd take the derivative of y prime, or y, right, and then try to find the normal line? Yes, it's negative. Yeah. Uh, there are other ways to do this, definitely. And there are ways without even using calculus that you could do this. So if you can do that, that's fine. So we get um, d equals the square root of x2 minus x1. So I'll do x2 is x, and x1 is 3. And then y2 minus y1 is going to be 9 minus x squared for y2. And then minus y1 is 9. So that. And you can clean it up a little bit. So if I FOIL out the inside, I get x squared minus 6x plus 9. And then the 9 minus 9 goes away. So I have negative x squared in parentheses squared. So plus x to the fourth. So before I take the derivative, I'm going to think of it as x to the fourth plus x squared minus 6x plus 9, and I'm going to raise it to the one-half power. Right, because it's under a square root. And now I take the derivative. So d prime is going to be one-half x to the fourth plus x squared minus 6x plus 9 to the negative one-half times... 4x cubed plus 2x plus, uh, minus 6. So the derivative of the inside. And it's kind of gross. Do you guys see why I didn't like these? It's not very fun. So to find the critical value, you set your denominator equal to 0. 
So your denominator is 2, square root of x to the fourth plus x squared minus 6x plus 9. And then the numerator is 4x cubed plus 2x minus 6. So you set your numerator equal to 0 and your denominator equal to 0. Okay. And really, these ones are always gross, so you can use your calculator to help you. So what you're going to do is, I would plug in for y1, I would plug in that uh, 4x cubed just the numerator, 4x cubed plus 2x minus 6, and I would graph it. Anybody have any guesses? It's actually a pretty easy number to guess. It actually is 1, yeah. Um, and that is the only place that it crosses. So you can graph it. So when you graph the numerator, it looks something like this, and it's crossing at 1. Okay, so you can, you can do that, um, but you do get x equals 1. And then when you set your denominator equal to 0, I would probably even just put the part that's under the square root. I wouldn't even worry about the square root part. And I would graph that. And you know it's next to the fourth curve, so you're thinking, okay, this might be like a W shape or something. Or, you know, at least goes up like that, like both sides go up. Since it's x squared plus, or x to the fourth plus x squared, it's not actually going to be a W shape. But we'll graph it. And then you really have to play around with your window. But when I played around with my window, I saw that it, um, it does something like this. And it never crosses. You guys see? So we're not getting any critical values from the bottom. So if we're plugging into D1, or D prime, and I'm plugging in numbers on the left and right of 1. If I try like 0 on the numerator, I get negative 6. And then on the bottom, I get 2 times square root of 9, so 6. So I get a negative number. And if I try like 2, I get positive on top and positive on the bottom. So positive. So that means I'm going down and then up, so it is definitely a minimum. So remember, if you were taking, if you were taking an AP test, you would have to write uh, d prime is less than 0 on negative infinity to 1. d prime is greater than 0 on 1 to infinity. Right? You'd have to write all of that. You even have to draw the graph. Right? Well, the graph they don't look at at all. So yeah. that's why you have to write that. Yeah. You don't have to really. Yeah, you don't have to draw the graph again. The reason, I always thought like calculus teachers used the same graph until I started going to like AP conferences and so on and I realized that they don't. Like some calculus teachers use like a giant like grid of information about the first second and, well about the F, F prime and F double prime, right, which is very confusing. I just think like having one number line is much easier, but um, so I think that's why they stopped grading them because teachers will teach it in different ways. All right, so, um, so the point that's, so let's so find the point. So what is our answer then? 1, 1 comma 8. Exactly. You plug in into the 9 minus x squared and you get 8. So that's your point. All right. This was an actual AP question a few years ago. All right. So it says we want to construct a box whose base length is 3 times the base width. Okay. So let's draw our box. And the base length is 3 times the width, so I'm going to do W and 3W. You could do L and W and change it to 3W eventually if you want to. But we know nothing about the height, so I'm going to keep that as H. It says the material used to build the top and the bottom cost $10 per square foot, and the material used to build the sides cost only $6 per square foot. Okay, so I don't know what kind of box you're making, but the top and the bottom are more expensive than the sides. And that, I think that happens. Think of like a cage, right? Maybe like the netting is different or like an aquarium. The glass is different, you know. There could be different things. Okay, so if the box must have a volume of 50 cubic feet, determine the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the box. Okay, when it says the box must have a volume of 50 cubic feet, that's what's allowing you to get it all in terms of x. Okay, so you're going to say the volume, which is length times width times height, has to be 50. So we have 3w times w times h. So if I'm trying to solve for h, I get 50 over 3w squared. Okay, and what we're trying to minimize is minimizing the cost. 
So I'm going to write C for cost. And it's a little weird. So let's talk about each side in particular. So let's talk about this right side. First, we talk about the area. So it's usually W times H, but we're not going to use H. So we're going to say the area of the right side is W times 50 minus 3W squared. So if the area was like 10 square feet, then if I wanted to find the cost of that, just that side, I would multiply it by 6. So I'd say, oh, it's $60, $60 for each side, or for the, just that side. Does that make sense? Because it's $6 per square foot. So I take that and I multiply by 6. So this is just the right side of the box. So do you guys notice that the left side of the box is exactly the same? So we're going to do times 2. So this is the right and left. And the 50 times, or the W times 50 over 3W squared, that was the area of the right side. Okay, so that's the first part. And we do plus. So what about the front and the back? So the front is going to be 3W times H. So we're going to say 3W times 50 over 3W squared. So that's the area of the front. What's the cost of the front of the box? Six. And we not only have the front, but we also have the front and the back, right? Front and back. All right, but we also have the top and the bottom. So our top and the bottom is going to be, we have uh, W times 3W is the area. It costs $10 per square foot. And then again, there's a top and a bottom. So this was not an open box this time. There actually is a top and box. So we do a lot of simplifying. So on the first one, we have W times 50 over 3W squared times 6 times 2. So let's do 50 times 2. 50 times 2 is 100 times 6, 600, divided by 3, 200. So I have 200, and then I have 200 over W, right? So I'm going to write it as 200 W to the negative 1. All right, now the next chunk, the front and the back. So let's do the 50 times 2 again. So 50 times 2 is 100, times 6 is 600, and then see how these 3s actually cancel. So we have 600, and then over W again, right? So 600 W to the negative 1. And the last one, I have 60 W squared. So you can combine it a little bit. You have 800 W to the negative 1 plus 60 W squared. And now we take the derivative. Okay, so that's our cost equation. We want to we want to minimize the cost, so we take the derivative. So I say C prime equals negative 800 W to the negative 2 plus 120 W. So whenever I have um, fractions, I try to combine my fractions. So in this case, it's negative 800 over W squared plus 120W. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by W squared over W squared on the 120W. So I get C prime equals negative 800 plus 120W cubed all over W squared. So if I find my critical values, I find them from both the numerator and the denominator. So denominator is easier, I get, easy, I get 0. And then the numerator, if I set it equal to 0, I get 800 over 120. And then I take the cube root. Let's just go ahead and find the decimal. Uh, I don't remember the repeating thing. Oh, then take the cube root. 1.882, yeah. And you might want to store that because sometimes you'll have to go back and find like other things using that value. So I would store it and store it as A. Do you guys remember store? We talked about that a lot. So store. So stow and then alpha A. So our question was determine the dimensions. Okay, so our dimensions are going to be the 3WW and then the H. So for dimensions, 
I start out with that 1.882, and that's in what feet? And then I have times, so I'm going to multiply that by 3. So 5.646 feet. And then the last one I have 50 divided by 3 um, w squared. Take that answer that I had as a and square it. So I get 4.705 feet for that last one. So those are our answers. Does that make sense? I know these are weird. In general, you know, optimization, I don't think, like, people usually do well on it in the end, but if they kind of wait to do their homework, they struggle on it. So if you kind of wait till midnight to start your homework, as many high school students do, I know you guys have a lot of things going on, uh, then you will be um, a little bit confused. So do this one early. <laughs> All right, here we go. So our printer needs to make a poster that will have two, uh, a total area of 200 square inches. So the whole poster is going to be 200 square inches. So we can do x times y, but we know that x times y equals 200. So really, we could write y as 200 over x. That was allowing us to get it in one variable right there. OK, and it's going to have one inch margins on the sides. And it's going to have a 1.5 inch margin at the top and a 2 inch margin at the bottom. Oh, wait, other way. <laughs> 2 inch margin on the top and 1.5 on the bottom. OK, what dimensions of the poster will give the largest printed area? So when you talk about the printed area, it's just the area of the you know, type, which is going to be in here. So we need to find that area. How do we represent that area? So in order to do that, we need this portion, the part I'm drawing in green. We need that length. So originally, the whole thing along the outside was x. This whole distance was x. But how much did I take out from the right and the left? One inch. Does that make sense? One inch and one inch on both sides. So we're going to have x minus 2. Do you understand that? All right, now this other piece right here, the height of the printed area, it was originally 200 minus x, or 200 over x. And now we're subtracting out 2 and 1.5. So it's going to be, uh, it's kind of hard to write, 200 over x minus 3.5. So our largest printed area, you can write A for area or P for printed area, whatever you want to do. Our area is going to be x minus 2 times 200 over x minus 3.5. That's what we're trying to maximize. OK, and a lot of times, like I think one of your homework problems, I do this in reverse. I give you the printed area. Like I give you that as x and y. And then I tell you how big it's going to go out for the margins. Does that make sense? So sometimes I mix it up. So you've got to think about what's the best thing to make your x and y. All right, so we multiply this out. So I have x times 200 over x, so I get 200. And I have minus 3.5x, right? And then I have minus 400 over x, so I'm going to do 400x to the negative 1. And then plus 7. So we can combine the 200 and the 7 and get 207, but when we take the derivative, they go away anyway, right? So we're going to do a prime equals. So we're going to have negative 3.5 plus 400x to the negative 2. We clean it up a little bit. So I have negative 3.5 plus 400 over x squared. So I always want to combine. So I'm going to multiply by x squared over x squared. So I get 400 minus 3.5 x squared on top all over x squared. So I set my numerator equal to 0 and my denominator equal to 0. So I'm going to do the 400 minus 3.5x squared. And 
I get x equals 10.690. It'd really be plus or minus, but it can't be negative, right? And then when I set my denominator equal to 0, I get 0. So I'm going to skip the number line part. I know that breaks your heart. <laughs> Can I skip it on your homework or on your notes that you guys remember to do it on the AP test? No. Yeah. <laughs> so you should probably do it on your homework then. Um, so we'll have a little number line so you can draw it. And you'd have 0, and that's really an endpoint. You can't go less than 0. And you're going to have 10.690. And you would want to pick numbers that are really close to that. All right, so what dimensions of the poster will give you the largest printed area? So we want the dimensions. And if you check, it does go up and then down. So you're fine. But. So x, we're talking about the dimensions of the poster, so we have 10.690. And then y is 200 divided by that answer. So it's going to be 18.708 inches. Does that make sense? So it's a similar process if I asked for the dimensions of the printed area, but I gave you the dimensions of the poster. You just kind of work the other way. All right. So the next one's a little bit weird. This is called a Norman window. It's a special type of window. I'm sure that you guys have seen these in houses before. So it says a window is being built, and the bottom is a rectangle. And the top is a semicircle. Have you guys seen this before? There is? Where do we have a Norman window? Oh, yeah, the stained glass, oh, yeah, glass one. So if there are 12 meters of framing materials, what, what must the dimensions of the window be to let in the most light? So this, this part right here that I drew as a solid line, I'm actually going to draw it as a dotted line. Because when you make the Norman window, it's actually all glass there. Right? There's not like a... A line. Sometimes there is like a wooden line or whatever, but we're just doing just all glass. So we want to know the dimensions to let in the most light. What does that mean? Most yeah, we want the maximum area. <laughs> all right. So I've done this lots of different ways in the past. The easiest way I think for students to understand is to let this distance be r, because this whole thing here would be 2r. And when you talk about uh, the part along the top, the framing material is like the, the wood or whatever that goes around. You can actually bend wood to make a circle. Um, so we want to know just this part that I've marked in green. What would that distance be? IR. Yeah, it's, it's half the circumference, right? So half the circumference. Don't say that. <laughs> it's going to be half of 2 pi r, which is just pi r. So we have pi r along the top. But we don't know what um, the height, this part that I'm kind of bolding for you guys, we don't know what that is. So we have h and h. But we do know that there are 12 meters of framing materials. Okay. So what we're going to have is h plus pi r plus h plus 2r has to equal 12. You see what I did there? I went all the way around. H, pi r, H, 2 r. So 2 H equals 12 minus 2 r minus pi r. So H is going to be 6 minus r minus pi over 2 r. Our area of the window is made up of a rectangle and a semicircle, right? So our rectangle's area is going to be 2r times h. And our semicircle area is going to be 1 half of pi r squared. So we're getting everything in terms of r. So I'm going to have a equals 2r times 6 minus r minus pi over 2r plus one-half pi r squared. And we'll go ahead and simplify a little bit. We'll multiply that 2r in. So we have 12r 
minus 2r squared minus pi r squared plus 1 half pi r squared. And you can combine a little bit. You have a lot of r squareds going on, but I don't want to combine like all of the r squareds. I just want to combine these two. Do you guys see why just these two? Because they have a pi too. So if I have negative pi r squared plus 1 half pi r squared, do you see how you get negative 1 half pi r squared? So I can combine to that at least. So that's our error. Are you all with me? Almost. I go fast, I know. So I always get on my evaluation. She talks so fast. I always say, slow down. All right, take the derivative. So I have 12 minus 4r minus, so I'm going to have the 1 half times 2, so that becomes 1, and I have pi r. So let's add the 4r and the pi r over. So we have less uh, negatives. So 4r plus pi r equals 12. And I'm trying to solve for r. So see how you can pull out an r? Or you could just combine those as decimals too. I'm cool with that. So you get 12 over 4 plus pi, which we'll go ahead and find as a decimal anyway. One point six eight zero. You guys get it? All right. So store that just in case you need it, because a lot of times you have to go back in and find other things with that number. So the question said, what must the dimensions of the window be to let in the most light? Okay. So we have our R. So it's kind of weird, like for a Norman window, to write the dimensions because, like, wait, there's no like length and width and height. So what I would probably do is just draw like a little sketch of it, and the bottom is going to be one point six. 8, 0 times 2, right, because it was 2R. So we get 3.361. And then the H, we go back here to find H, is going to be 6 minus R, which I have stored as A right now, uh, minus pi over 2, and then times R, which I have stored as A. So it actually ends up being the same as what r was actually, 1.680. That happens a lot in calculus where you actually get the same numbers. A lot of these squares are the maximum area and so on. So, okay, does that make sense? Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how you. I mean, you can find the top by that that radius, right? So I think it's fine if you just leave it off. Yeah. You have to put the units in your final answer. Um, yeah, you really should put in like feet or whatever. Did I have? Yeah, I gave you meters, so you can put in meters. Oh. <laughs> a lot of times you get a point on your AP test just for that. I think you've already reached your maximum points anyway. Correct. Oh, you're pretty close. All right. All right. So last one. So it says uh, recall profit equals revenue minus cost. Average cost is total cost divided by number of items. We talked about these things before, right? So it says, suppose a car factory has a revenue function of r of x equals 300x and a cost function of c of x equals x cubed minus 6x squared plus 15x, where x represents the number of cars produced in one day. What is the average cost for 20 cars? So your average cost would be your total cost divided by the number that you're selling, x. So it's going to be x cubed minus 6x squared plus 15x over x. So we're going to have x squared minus um, 6x plus 15. So that's the average cost for x number of cars. I just divided the x in. So the average cost for 20 cars, we write it as c of 20 bar, right? So like this was c of x bar. That means average cost. It's going to be 20 squared minus 6 times 20 plus 15. Everybody have that? What do I say? 255? 295? <laughs> You're like right next to me and I still can't hear you. All right, 295. So that's going to be like the cost per 
car. I don't know what kind of car this is. <laughs> I know. I should have made this a little bit nicer. Uh, maybe it's like a toy car. I don't know. <laughs> That's an expensive toy car. It could be like one of those, you know, those ones that my, my son want for Christmas where you like ride down the street like with your brother. It's like one of those cars. We'll say that. Go-kart? Yeah, go-kart. I don't know. So what is the cost of producing the 20th car? So the cost of producing the 20th, and it is just the, the cost for them. I mean, they could sell it for much more, right? <laughs> So what is the cost of producing the 20th car? So we're going to have C of, do you guys remember how to do this? Just the 20th car? Yep, exactly. C of 20 minus C of 19. So I would probably just plug in C into your calculator to find both of them really quickly. So plug it in for Y1. Then go to your table and plug in 20 and 19. So we get 5,900 minus 4,978. And then there's a production level that maximizes profit. If so, what is it? So your profit is going to be revenue minus cost. So our profit equation is going to be the revenue, which was 300x minus the cost function, which is x cubed minus 6x squared plus 15x. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and combine and then take the derivative. So we get 285x minus x cubed plus 6x squared. Okay. And we take the derivative and so on. Um, but this ends up being a downwards um, cubic function, so it ends up being the second critical value. So you'd find those two critical values, right, set it equal to, so we'd find p prime and set it equal to 0 and then solve. So I'm not going to continue this because we ran out of time, but you guys could do that. So set it equal to zero and solve. Um, so you could use quadratic formula. You might be able to factor. I don't know. Um, but you'd find two critical values, and I think it will end up being the second critical value that will maximize. All right, and then if you guys notice, I have a super challenge. So this is another thing where if you can do it and bring me all of the work, I might give you a bonus point. So if you get it, well, if you get it correct, you got to get it correct to get the bonus point.